lightning presentation. Very interested to see how the, how the crisis caused a uh, very important why. Hopefully, we don't have quite such a crisis here in WA. One thing you did re reflect was that the WA government has started the process um, with a very important whole system planning, which is a uh, key first step in WA. However, as of today, there is actually no organisation responsible for delivering reliable energy at lowest possible cost. What's your opinion of that situation? Uh, well, well, I don't know the specific uh, circumstances that um, apply here in South Australia. I understand you have an Office of Public Utilities which uh, supervises the, uh, the plan. So ultimately you, you'll need a piece of bureaucracy that's fit for purpose. I suppose the only thing I would um, uh, suggest from my experience is that it, it needs to have the skills and the capacities to um, evaluate what what emerges uh, from this process, uh, and that's not that's not simple, you know, because a lot of this is um, doing things for the first time. I suppose the other thing, because of the pace of change, you also need to find a way of building into this the flexibility to be able to to not exclude technologies um, that that might provide part of the solution. I mean, part of our renewable technology fund was to fund a whole range of things, whether it, I mean, obviously we've you've got solar thermal, the big battery, and, um, and and the virtual power plant on the rooftops, but then there's uh, pumped hydro, uh, the, there's bio um, uh, mass um, generation, uh, and then of course um, uh, the hydrogen and the, the capacity to turn that into a liquid fuel. So, you know, we've, we're trying, you, you need to obviously s somehow in parallel evaluate new things as well as things that are existing. Minister? Well, I'm not quite sure what the premise of the question is because um, when you say there's no single body responsible for the reliability of the system, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that because. Um, we actually have uh, a capacity market in Western Australia that's designed to provide sufficient generation to ensure that um, the system can cope. And the AMO is, of course, responsible for dispatching the power. Two thirds of the power is, is traded on bilateral contracts. So I'm not quite sure what you're driving at. Transition. Sure. Okay. okay. So, yes, it's probably true that, I mean, there hasn't been. You know, this is, of course, go back uh, to when I was a shadow as to what was my single biggest criticism of the uh, energy market re reform was that it didn't focus on the future. I mean, my, I used to, the quote I think I had was that the energy market review was preparing the energy system for 1998. Um, that's what we announced last week, that, well, three weeks ago, was that the AMO Western Power led by the PUO, would prepare the whole system plan by the middle of 2020. I don't think there's any, it's not realistic to have that whole system plan uh, done faster than that, because sure, you could do a whole system plan, but it wouldn't be comprehensive. Of course, there's actually a second piece of work there that's uh, I announced as well, which is the distributed energy roadmap, distributed energy resources roadmap, which I think is just as important as the whole of system plan because that's going to guide the decisions that I'll have to make over the near term because that's to report by Christmas about uh, what regulatory change there needs to be to make sure that uh, the future that's described in the AMO report never happens because that's one of the things that's not clear from today's news reporting is the AMO is saying this is what will happen if you don't do anything. But of course, the reason that the AMO actually welcomed the two pieces of work that we announced was because they are the things that they need to be ready uh, for the future without as much thermal or current thermal generation. Thank you, Ian. Um, Jay, you mentioned that um, a carbon price would have um, supported investment in, in um, alternative power generation and would have made a difference. but. Um, Using a reverse crystal ball process, how, um, how how do you think things would have panned out if, if um, there had been a, uh, an effective carbon price in place over, over the last um, four or five years? 
Well, if it was large enough to encourage fuel switching between coal and gas, you'd invest in a new gas fired generation. Provided the market believed that that price signal would remain in place. Mm -hmm. And that's a big question mark. Because we've had the climate wars over the last decade, and it's been at the fulcrum of uh, essentially national politics, it's become one of the sort of articles of faith that you, because you know, essentially Tony Abbott won an election on the basis of demonising a, a carbon tax, uh, it's it sort of become that hot button issue. And so, you know, you, you couldn't really be certain that um, any policy would endure. So even if it was put in place, well, it was put in place, it, mm. it was yep. repealed. Exactly. So um, if, it, if though we were to, if it was put back in place again, one of the problems now is there have been so many insults to the market that, see, markets need two things to change their behaviour, a price signal, but then also belief that it's going to be enduring. Mm. Yeah. And so there is a bit of an open question now whether the price on carbon by itself would be sufficient. And my, my view is that it probably is unlikely there will need to be some other action. Part of the, potentially part of, maybe a bit of a guide is what we did with our procurement. It may well be that, I mean, ironically, this isn't a million miles away from what the conservative governments are talking about, which is underwriting uh, generation. Although, obviously, they're talking about coal. We're talking about underwriting you know, the capacity so, say an integrated system plan throw up a certain distribution of assets having regard to your emissions profile, that's what you would underwrite. Not, not just propping up coal because you've got this ideological commitment to it. So I think the short answer is um, it might have made a difference. More gas generation which would have firmed up uh, supply, would have written more contracts, would have put downward pressure on prices, would have reduced carbon emissions. Uh, would have got rid of reliability issues, but there's no guarantee that people would have invested in it because they were uncertain about whether it'd be enduring. Yeah. One of the barriers you mentioned was the um, around jobs, particularly around men of a certain age, of which were overrepresented here. I noticed, um, and and and. They, and, and and their concern around what it meant for, for them. In a, in a, in a well-managed transition, what, what sort, what, how, how do you deal with that? What kind of jobs do you think will come, will come forward and how do you turn that argument around? Yeah, I mean, well, Port Augusta was interesting in that, um, I mean, solar thermal, if it ultimately gets up, actually uses a technology that's not dissimilar to coal-fired uh, generation because it's a steam turbine. So some of those workers, not, not as many, uh, it's much less um, labour intensive, but it will provide some opportunities. Uh, interestingly, the person that's leading the campaign for the solar thermal plant, that the community campaign, is a former uh, engineer, um, an operator in the, the coal-fired power station. So it has broad community support. Um, in that town, though, it also has other jobs. There's a a uh, thing called um, Sundrop Farms, which is one of the largest um, uh, greenhouse, which uh, desalinates water um, and warms the crops um, during the cold sort of desert nights, and grows. It's got this massive long-term contract with coals to supply uh, tomatoes to the whole of the country. So it's it's a massive thing. Um, that's a couple of hundred jobs there, 50 jobs in a solar thermal plant, hundreds building it. Um, so, uh, I mean, they're, they're examples of, in, of, of jobs in that sector, but there's also a broader conversation that needs to be had, you know, with, with the individual's concern. We, we, we had to go through this to some degree ourselves with the closure of Holden. So we had a, you know, Holden, it's a different issue in a in a metropolitan area because you've got more options. But you know it was already an area of high unemployment. Uh, a lot of those workers saw that as their identity and mm. and you know a lot of difficult conversations have had to happen inside families. 
you know, the male was the breadwinner. The, the jobs that are being created tend to be more <coughs> female occupations. What does that mean for the distribution of work in a family? Uh, what does it mean uh, in terms of... We, we, we brought in a, uh, some support around wellbeing. So how do people actually confront this issue from their own personal, personal life journey? And that became powerful uh, because it's very easy you know, for especially small communities to become defeated by these big changes they need to. So really, the, in, in short, paint a picture for the future and show them how they fit into it and then help them to be part of that. And it, it may not be in power generation, it may be something else. Of course, here in West Australia, the Collie community is uh, the one that's impacted so dramatically by this transition. Um, it, it makes me cry at night when I think about the $320 million that was spent by the last government on the UJA AB because clearly had that been allocated to supporting the transition that we all knew was occurring, and again this is not, I told you so, but we actually said it at the time. In fact, uh, Alana McTiernan in, in 2009 was on the record uh, talking about the uh, complexities of carbon uh, with the refurbishment of the user AB. And I'll tell you what, I'd love to have $320 million available to me right today to help with that transition. In respect of the individual workers at the power station, I'm not meaning this in a flippant way, but that, the, you know, as a former union official, I can assure you that finding a solution to, the, to that situation is actually quite easy because it's a negotiation like any other and you can come to a conclusion. And all those guys have skills that translate elsewhere into the resources sector. And, you know, as the Minister for Mines and Petroleum, I can tell you there's plenty of jobs available right now for skilled workers in the resource sector in Western Australia. South Australia, you know, if you've got a couple of place there, send them over. But the problem then is the township of Collie because the probability is those workers wouldn't stay in Collie. So what we have to do is two interrelated but actually separate matters. The first is the transition for the, both the, our direct employees and the implication for the coal companies, which obviously are not our direct employees. But then there's the second transition question about making sure there's a bright future for coal. And you know, I'm principally responsible for dealing with the city workers and you know, we, we're talking to the unions about that, and my friend Alana McTiernan is responsible for the broader question of the college transition, and, and she's working hard on that. And of course, Mick Murray wouldn't let us get away without doing that job well, so, you know, the people of college have got the advantage of a strong advocate in, in Mick Murray. Uh, I've got a question uh, regarding uh, energy security uh, and the the issue of state ownership of assets. Uh, sorry, yeah. uh, the issue of state ownership of assets for purpose of energy security. Now, our capacity market in WA is largely all the certified generation, 660 odd million of capacity payments to them, and so it's almost like everything that's connected is paid a capacity fee according to its operational activity, whether it's 90% operational, whatever the capacity is for that particular asset. But how do we come to a conclusion on the best uh, solution for the likes of, in, in the case of uh, WA Synergy, it owns most of the uh, generation assets for the state in terms of uh, production of electricity. Uh, 50 odd percent of those assets are coal-fired and they're in the final years of their um, decline. And as we saw in the papers today, they're, uh, they're possibly closer to their end of, end of life than we may wish to be uh, comfortable about. So how would you handle that in terms of uh, state ownership or private ownership? What would be the, the, the approach that uh, should be adopted? Sure, look, I mean, um, yes, we, the look at bright energy, that's not, uh, you know, whilst there is a synergy ownership there, that's, uh, overwhelmingly private investment and it's important to understand that Synergy does not have a life of asset PPA with those uh, facilities so they will be, I'll have to take their risks uh, at, a, at a sometime in the future. I mean, 
Sydney did to talk about the details of the contract, but the, the, it was very important to the government that it wasn't a life of asset uh, arrangement for those uh, for those facilities. Clearly, there will be more space in generation for uh, privately owned renewal uh, renewal uh, generation. Um, there's a you know there's um, it'll be interesting to see what happens with uh, private. Uh, investment in new uh, gas-fired thermal generation, whether there's anybody who wants to go into that space, it's not clear that that's going to happen. Um, but, but having said that, of course, the reason that we uh, you know, have a good level of security is because we do have a lot of gas assets here in Western Australia, and the, that's, this is not well understood, but that's actually why the, prop, the, the, the discussion about the EPA moving quickly on carbon was such a problem because if you can't get the browse gas to the northwest shelf then there is no gas to reserve because the whole point of a reservation policy is that it's reserving exports and without LNG exports there's no gas to reserve domestically so that's why actually the entire system and the entire transition plan for the system relies on continuing exports of LNG and that's I don't know that that's properly understood by people in the debate. Um, but clearly uh, there will be less government-owned assets in the future because as we retire them, the likelihood is that it will be private investment that replaces them. And remember, the number one piece of private investment in generation is rooftop solar. And, and the, you know, the DER and the whole system plan is about how you make the best use of that. I mean, everybody talks about the duck, but actually there's a lot of opportunities. The duck is actually an opportunity. If you've got this incredibly cheap energy for four or five hours a day, well, you can do stuff with that. So this is an exciting opportunity. And I know that you know the, the newspaper in Western Australia has an particular attitude of these things, and that's understandable because it's easy for a newspaper to say that there's a crisis than to say there's an opportunity. I mean, I wish we'd own our, uh, I mean, obviously if we'd own the coal-fired generator, uh, it would have put in a more orderly exit, uh, and which would have uh, assisted us. Actually, we have one of our uh, SEN uh, members, uh, Rob, uh, Rob Meacham, where are you? Ah, there's Rob. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes, um, today we're talking about the electricity system, but of course, with regards to the climate change, it's a uh, much wider problem, and the emissions are coming from many other different sections. And um, just referring back to the question of a carbon price and having it um, to be enduring, um, this idea that's um, being put forward of um, uh, putting a price on carbon at source um, and then distributing that back to every household and every citizen, um, in my mind that would make it a very enduring because um, when you go to the polls again, next election, you know, if every citizen was receiving, um, you know, $2,000 a year via a, um, a dividend from um, a royalty on, on um, carbon, I think that would help make it enduring. What's your opinion on that? Well, I think it's right that I think people pocketed their compensation, actually, for uh, the uh, carbon price mm -hmm. and uh, said thank you very much and uh, it didn't do anything to, you know, to, to support the price. I suppose my point, though, about the carbon price was really narrowly about the electricity market. It was about how market participants like energy companies that are taking 30-year positions on very expensive pieces of plant equipment, whether it be transmission assets or generation assets, they, you imagine going to your board of directors and saying, here's what our business case looks like, but there's a big hole in it if, if this alters. So say you're a coal-fired generator and you're thinking about, and this is exactly what happened with Hazelwood, they had about $600 million worth of work that needed to be done to it. And they would have, they would have wondered what the future was going to look like in terms of 
a price on carbon and they would have had all this spectrum of estimates and it would have looked pretty ugly and they said no, so they let it shut. And if you were a gas generator that was betting on a, the price of carbon being higher than coal, you'd want to know that that was there for 30 years before you'd take that investment. So the only new private investment in thermal generation, as I understand, it's really been in peaking plants in sort of short term in the national electricity market, that is, because they can see they can get their money back in the next five years, but not necessarily in the next 30. So that was the, I was really mentioning, I think your point about a carbon price more generally in the economy, I think, you know, I think that, that that's a sort of slightly different, I was making a slightly different point. I think your point's accurate if you're talking about economy-wide price on carbon. Remember what happened there, though, it was a pee and thimble trick. They said, you can't put a price on carbon in the whole economy because it's too hard and it's got all these transaction costs. Why don't you just focus on the electricity sector? Uh, because that's where that's the dirtiest part of the economy. It's where all the big gains can be made. Then they say, oh, well, OK, we're going to make the electricity sector only do what we promised to do in Paris, which was 26% reduction. And then they say, well, then you have to do 26% reduction in the rest of the economy, so you have to slaughter 26,000 cows, 26% of the cows. So, you know, see, they keep shifting the debate. I mean, basically what you've got is some people just don't believe in climate change, and they just shift the goalposts and try and, they just try and basically frustrate you every, it's what Malcolm found. Mm -hmm. You know, every time he thought he was improving the policy to appease them, they, were interested, they weren't interested in improving the policy, they're interested in killing him. Mm. Good point. Okay, any more questions? Oh, Rob, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ian. Uh, uh, Jay and uh, perhaps the Minister would want to comment as well. And this question's in the context that uh, uh, in the information that was provided alongside the announcement of the uh, planning that uh, was going to be uh, undertaken uh, was uh, a business as usual scenario that was purely to be used as a benchmark. That business as usual scenario predicted that by 2030 coal would produce 35% of Swiss electricity. Uh, the Swiss is the southwest integrated system, by the way. Yeah. Uh, renewables would be 35% and the, and the rest gas. But uh, Alinta has recently said that it closed down uh, South Australia's coal-fired power station because it could not compete with new renewables, but at that stage, I think you were about 35% renewables, and yet your coal-fired power station wasn't able to compete with that amount of uh, renewables in the system. Can you help us understand why the economics of the system forced the Linter to close the station? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's really that point I was mentioning before, where, um, I mean, something special about Alinda, Lee Creek, you know, essentially was burning dirt. You know, it was pretty low-grade coal. It's not coal in the sense that you, we'd sort of generally understand it. So it's very inefficient. And it was getting less so and harder to get at. So the, the pit was near the end of its viable life. So it was going to have to close at some point in any event. Um, it, so two things happened. Demand dropped, and particularly demand in South Australia because of the closure of industrial concerns that really the stripping out of manufacturing, big energy users. And that was that phenomenon I mentioned before about the, the mandatory renewable energy target was predicated on growth in energy consumption. And so the, the renewables were to take up the growth and leave the, the, the um, thermal generators with sufficient to, to keep chugging along. But what they did is they stripped out that together with you know, riptop solar plus also just generally renewables stripped out the big slabs of the day where they are really operating at zero marginal cost and so coal just wasn't being dispatched or if it was it was having to sometimes pay to stay on and it just destroyed its business case. So it really is a combination of things. It was renewables but also collapse in demand. And, but the context, but, but you need, it's a sort of a bit of a false argument because this thing was going to close anyway. 
you know, it was old and it was getting near the end of its viable life. And so, you know, people are fond of saying we should have propped it up, but it would have been... You know, of course, the problem is if you'd propped it up, immediately what happened when it, it went under and we put our energy plan in place is that Pelican Point came out of mothballs and AGL promised to reinvest in another unit in their, in their um, Barker Inlet uh, gas fire generator. So, you know, the problem with it, if you're in a market, when you pull one lever, something else happens. Unless you own the whole thing, in which case you're in charge. I love Western Australia, most of them. Sort of, sort of in charge. Apart from generation. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Don't forget that we have a very different dynamic here. Uh, we, have a, we have the capacity payments, and so the energy component of, of any generator's income is significantly lower here. That's why we have a price cap. And our price cap is, is tiny compared to what happens. I mean, the, in the East Coast, the, the individual uh, uh, kilowatt hours can go up to $14,000, $15,000, uh, megawatt hours go up to $14,000, $15,000, and individual moments in the system. Ooh, I can't remember our cap, but it's in the hundreds of dollars. Yeah, it's, three, 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 three. Yeah, it's, it's so much lower. And so the reason for that is because you're being paid to have the capacity to generate. So, um, you know, what's exciting is that the East Coast are now talking about a, a, a effect, like part of the, the net reliability obligation is a capacity market. It's just a bilaterally traded uh, a capacity market. Around the world, most Western countries are moving to capacity markets. We've already got one. What can we do with it? What, what, are, what are the opportunities that, because we have one, to, uh, to make our system more dynamic for the future? And that's one of the things we'll consider. Thank you. Okay, next question. Um, yes. Uh, um, yes. I'm on the I'm one of the 10,000 engineers that's got the Norfolk shelf up and going. Tokyo runs or makes sense of electrical grid from WA exported LNG. So why can't every other capital in Australia run from <laughs> LNG? We've got these huge tankers around the world, tens of thousands of tankers that could easily transport LNG from Perth or WA, Karatha um, and, and Browse projects and simply tie up a ship in Sydney, Adelaide, Queensland, and stop all this fracking. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. well, it's interesting why this, uh, there's actually, most of the gas in Queensland doesn't use fracking, but that's a minor detail. Um, it's interesting how that gas came to be exported. The Queensland government introduced a gas mandate for its electricity system. And that was effectively, even though it wasn't said out loud, was to support the Papua New Guinea uh, gas project, which of course has now been developed as an LNG facility. So the idea was to provide a market to the gas coming from New Guinea so that the people of New Guinea had an income source to raise themselves out of poverty. And so when the Queensland government introduced the gas mandate, uh, then people said, oh, what about all this gas here in the coal? which used to just get vented when the coal was being mined. Um, so it's actually interesting to see, you know, you, you, you've got to be careful of these things because one thing can lead to another. Um, you know, South Australia is the first place in Australia to have uh, gas come from uh, shale resources and, and Jay actually referenced it in his presentation. So the question about uh, releasing um, uh, gas from shales is a question of managing the environmental risks. And we've done our scientific uh, study, musically led by Tom Hatton, you know. Uh, but, uh, um, and it came to the conclusion that, uh, the, that 12 out of the other 13, sorry, 11 out of the other 13 inquiries in Australia came to that in a properly managed approach. You can, prop, you can uh, extract uh, shale gas or gas from shales without uh, unnecessary risk. Now that's just, they're the facts. I mean, it doesn't matter what you say, they're the facts. 
Japan is about to start importing gas from the United States, which is out of shale. Um, Germany buys coal from America because shale has displaced coal, which is one of the things about why carbon emissions in the US fell, was because they were using gas instead of coal. Um, the, the, the shales in the, in the Kimberley are unlikely to make a major contribution to gas production for a long time because there's no infrastructure. And those, you know, it'll take those companies a long time to develop their projects if that ever happens. Just on your direct point, we're of two projects that are doing precisely that, one in New South Wales and the other in, in South Australia, pulling up a, a, a ship and, and, and proposing generation. I don't know whether they'll get anywhere, but they're serious. I think, I think we're also serious about taking uranium up the uh, channel at Adelaide there. And <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that was your government. Uh, no, I, can, I can talk about that if you want. Okay. To. <laughs> Why not? No, look, you know, South Australia held its uh, Royal Commission into uh, the uranium industry. It was a really, really good uh, uh, thing for them to do. And I actually would read the full report, not just the summaries, the full report as soon as I could. Um, but the reason, I mean, we have four approved projects in Western Australia, none of which have proceeded to production. Uh, and the reason for that is their strike price is way above the, the current price. The price of uranium today is lower than it was in 1948, if you take strip out inflation. And, and in, in dollar terms, it's about the same. If you have a look at the long term, apart from one bubble, it's been flat for, for 60 years. And interestingly, they're now talking about, you know, generation three nuclear reactors. Well, you know, this is an iPhone six in my pocket, and now they're up to iPhone ten. You see, the point I'm making there is the nuclear energy technologies are very slow to change because they live for 80, 60, 80 years. So a generation is that long. Whereas a gas-fired peaker, you get your capital back after three, four years. You know, that means that the technology in those facilities is going to change much faster. So there's nothing. You know, nuclear energy does not make any sense. Electricity production makes no sense. I think it was three hundred dollar carbon price. It was the what it said in the Royal Commission um, to make it to uh, make it uh, viable with other technologies. So um, you know, it's just not it's not an issue for us. And they come in one gigawatt leaks, which is a bit large. I mean, what's our four gigawatts here? You know, you, you couldn't fit it into the Western Australian system. Even if you wanted it to, it wouldn't happen. So, you know, it's just not, it's not that... I understand why other countries might look at it for a carbon issue, but for us, it's just, I don't think it's viable. Certainly not in any free market economy, it's never going to be built. Um, okay, just uh, today, we, uh, we picked Jay up in a Tesla. We thought that was symbolic um, <laughs> from the airport. And on the way back, we discussed a few points, and uh, one of the things we talked about was low-hanging fruit. Uh, to decarbonise our economy, the two areas that we can decarbonise quickest in WA is transport and electricity. So there is a possibility of having some confluence between the two and being able to have the integration of um, battery storage. Uh, your Tesla has an 85 kilowatt hour battery, and you really only need uh, a Tesla Powerwall, which is 14 kilowatt hours, so you have a massive capacity there for charging and discharging on the grid. Jay, where do you see the uh, opportunities there in terms of government policy to be able to integrate transport and energy policy under one holistic? Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things about the Tesla grid level battery is how it's uh, shown possibilities that had hitherto not been thought were possible. So the, and these are meant to be people that I, I presume the, the apparatus of the, uh, the federal regulatory bodies, you would imagine, were pretty well across technological change, yet they didn't anticipate the sorts of things the battery could do. And there's been some spectacular examples recently where, I mean, many of you might be familiar with this lightning strike that hit simultaneously too two circuits in Queensland and it islanded every part of the national electricity market and created real 
instability issues in every one of those markets and, and created quite a risky situation, except in South Australia, because the, the big battery just at the time was, I think, charging and then started to discharge. Mm. And then as, as it separated, it, it then went, it went back into charging mode to, to essentially, in milliseconds, re-establish the frequency. So, um, I mean, the, the software that exists within cars and power walls um, I, I don't put it past the, you know, the IT engineers to be able to design a similar thing which in aggregate could occur. And it's not wildly dissimilar to what they're proposing for the virtual power plant where each of the rooftop solars and batteries are linked up together and then can respond in a, a smart interactive way with the national grid. So this is, it's not without its risk and care would need to be taken in, in how these things are integrated. but. Um, you know, maybe these are things which could be initially tried and trialled in some distributed grids, which give you an opportunity to test this technology before it's you know it goes into the in, into the national electricity grid. Because this is you know it's a very big machine, the national electricity grid, and uh, and even yours is a very long grid, a uh, very long thin grid. Mm. Minister, do you want to comment on the buses as well? Buses. Yeah. Yeah, look, first, before I get to buses, I just want to talk about. Uh, integration of batteries into our systems. So, you know, I recently announced with Western Power there's 43 standalone power systems being integrated into the wheat belt. Uh, Horizon, I think it's 18, is that right number, Paul? Yep, 18, he's nodding at me. 18 around Esperance for, uh, for Horizon. Um, there'll be more announcements about uh, standalone power systems and, and uh, microgrids in the future, but I mean, you know, we all know what Horizon's doing in Onslow, what Western Power is doing in Kalbarri, um, Pendry is next. Um, the people that are talking to me most at the moment about grid reliability is the people at Mullawa. And so, you know, we're looking to see how technology can apply there. You've got the battery down at, uh, at uh, Meadow Springs uh, that's been very successful, and, and we're, you know, talking to Western Power about what they might do to avoid uh, network augmentation using uh, batteries. Um, I just had a constituent the other day come and complain that uh, Western Power told him he'd only have three kilowatts on his roof instead of five like he wanted. So again, you know, that those sort of network constraining issues, uh, batteries might be part of the solution to that. Um, so yeah, we're really, really excited about the opportunity to save money by installing batteries. Here's a figure for you, you know, 30% of our Western Power distribution system supplies 2% of customers. Like who is ideal for the use of these uh, new technologies? And those 43 SPSs, uh, they keep the wire. So if we, you know, the, the wire will be de-energised, but it still remains. So there are opportunities for the future. Um, uh, don't forget too that and here's going to my advert. Uh, you know, we're the only place in the world that has all the materials that go into a battery here in Western Australia. We're, we're about to become the number one non-Chinese supplier of lithium hydroxide to the battery world. You know, Within five years, we're producing about 175,000 tonnes of uh, lithium hydroxide in Western Australia. Put that in context, five years ago, the world production was 250,000 tonnes. I mean, we are a major player in this space, and the government's done the... Uh, future battery industry strategy. Uh, the next step is to get a chemical precursor plant and then perhaps anode and cathode manufacturing and after that, uh, battery manufacturing. Of course, companies like Magellan Power are already in the battery assembly business and I'm sure there'll be lots of opportunities because we are moving down that battery pathway uh, for other Western Australian businesses. But, you know, we are, we are, you know, non-China central for the uh, future battery industry. In respect to buses, one of the interesting things about, it, I was just talking to Rita Safioli, the transport minister the other day, who was in discussion with some of the supplier, the, 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 the bus suppliers. I say one of the challenges is air conditioning, because uh, you know, in, in, you've got to have air conditioned buses in Western Australia, and it does have a big impact on their range. Um, but you know, we are actively looking at that, and of course, We've got the biggest build of, of metropolitan rail services the, through Metronet, which is all about transferring journeys from, uh, from you know, uh, 
traditional means to uh, electrify trains, so that's a, a big contribution to improving the energy efficiency of our transport system. So, you know, we're alive to these things. Thanks, uh, President. Uh, you talked about the need for South Australia to nationalise, was the word you used, and pointed to WA's um, ownership of a lot of those assets. I just wanted to contrast that for you with um, the situation that South Australia enjoyed a lot of investment in renewables from the national red, and WA, by contrast, enjoyed very little of that. So I was interested in your observations around that and to draw your attention to um, the fact that some people, particularly the sort of consultancies and the neoliberals around, think the natural course of events is to privatise synergy because then you get more investment uh, in generation and, you know, it just needs to be broken up because they haven't moved, you know, they've invested in one wind farm recently. Um, just, um, so in relation to uh, the, uh, the way in which the, the South Australian plan was put together. Uh, we didn't, we took, we took a, um, I mean the overarching principle was take control of our energy market and we, because we were in a national electricity market, we, we didn't have the luxury of Western Australia and being able to, uh, the influence that it, that it had in the existing market. So we, we had to, we intervened, but in a way which tried to preserve the integrity of the market. Because the problem is, if you intervene in the market as a non-market actor, if you don't pay a capacity payment to everyone, then you, you know you, you can't just pay a capacity payment to one person. You sort of like own the whole problem. Um, uh, so we, what we sought to do was put in a state-owned generator, the gas-fired fast start generator, which was for reserve shortfalls only and for system security only. It wasn't to be a, a, a market participant in the sense of competing with existing operators. Um, and similarly with the, the battery, it was, it was used to remedy market failure because of that regulatory problem I mentioned before about it not being able to get paid for its <laughs> services. So we sort of, we, it was in a mixed economy response really. I, mean, I used nationalisation a bit loosely there. We haven't in a sense, net, well, the first new generation that's been built in South Australia in since privatisation was us with the new gas fired generator um, in terms of uh, thermal generation. The, uh, in, in, I mean, all of the investments that have been made have been incentivised one way or another. So the renewable energy target was the principal driver for investment in wind uh, and to a lesser degree solar in South Australia. But, and that's because we've got great wind and solar resources, but it's also because we've got quite high prices. That's one of the reasons why they came there. So it wasn't purely, and it was also because they had a very far-sighted planning minister who in 2003 created very... Um, what, was, what was his name? Oh, I think he, Weatherall, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but they created a permissive planning regime. And we did, we actually did something pretty brave. We, we approved a wind farm um, on near the metropolitan area, it never got built, but it sent a very powerful political signal. The government was pro renewables, but also we took a position on wind farms. You know, we had a, a view they were beautiful, not ugly, and uh, but uh, which I know is controversial. But at the time, it was a pretty because the only issues that were raised back in the day were amenity issues. Yeah, I mean now we we hear about you know infrasound, infrasound, but that wasn't. That wasn't a go back then, so that's that's how we sort of approach. So it was a bit, you know, it's a bit of poetic license to talk about nationalisation. It was sort of intervention to correct market failure, um, and you know even the even the price on carbon is really a it's a pretty neoclassical sort of story. It's just putting a price on an externality so you get the efficient allocation of resources. So yeah, you know, we're not radicals here. Um, the radicals are the people that are. You know that, that aren't doing. I mean, you know, the great irony is that the Liberal Party are cast as the socialists with their command economy solution, like direct action. 
the Labor Party is the market. You know, guys wanting to, you know, let the market work. So there's a weird, there's a weirdness about this debate. It's even weirder when you think about the UK, <laughs> where this wasn't even a political issue. Mm. You know, Maggie Thatcher believed that we had to take action on climate change. It's a bipartisan issue. So we've turned it into a, we've turned it into a partisan issue in this country in a way it doesn't, that, that doesn't have uh, resonance around most of the world. I mean, Trump, of course, is. Jumped on, but but the but 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 that's but that's in a sense of detail because the states are all off acting, you know, like Texas, you know, wind yeah. farm central in uh, right. in the U.S. So you know, there's there's a different. This doesn't. We, we we need to remember we're a bit unusual here with with this being a Labor liberal conservative progressive issue. Thanks, Jay. Um, I don't know. How are we going for time? Uh, I know. Are we allowed a little bit more? Okay, well look, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd really like to thank our two uh, very special guests. Uh, Minister Johnson, thank you for uh, giving us your uh, take on the way things are, and Jay, for your great wisdom and uh, leadership in the past, uh, and you're bringing all the lessons learned. It's been a great opportunity. I just want to quote something from, uh, that was spoken by none other than the man sitting on my right. Um, he made a comment uh, that was in the public domain. It says, uh, there is an opportunity for us to renew ourselves. There is an opportunity for us to leave the past behind and present something different for the future. So that's none other than Jay Weatherall. Yeah.